Okay, so hello everyone, and thank you for being here. My name is Paul D'Ambrosio, and I teach Chinese philosophy at East China Normal University, where the Sukhai Weishui Collaborative Learning Project is based. Today, we want to welcome everyone to our fourth book discussion of the 2023-2024 academic year. We are hosting Professor Chu Chen, uh, Xu Chen Xiang from CDN University. And we have a very nice lineup of scholars from different places to discuss with Professor Xiang. Our commentators today include Professor Wang Hui Yu from Georgia State University, Professor Robin Wong from Loyola Marymount University, and Professor Jean Hu Jing, who's my colleague at East China Normal University. And we also have Dr. Hui Xianzhe from the University of Macau, or should your are you already started your um, postdoc, Richen? Uh, I'm still waiting for the uh, results. Okay, okay, yeah. yeah. So we'll still say yeah. from the University of Macau then. Um, yeah. And you're serving then as chair for this lecture. So again, I <laughs> yeah. want to thank everyone um, who's been invited and everyone in the audience for making this event possible today. Uh, the discussion will revolve around Professor Xiang's book titled Chinese Cosmopolitanism, The History and Philosophy of an Idea. The structure for this event is as follows. Dr. Hui will introduce Professor Xiang, and then Professor Xiang will give a general uh, outline of her book. And then we have discussion from three our three commentators. Um, they'll go one by one and discuss with Professor Xiang. Uh, after that part, we'll open up the floor uh, to anyone from the audience who would also like to discuss the book. Again, we'll end this event promptly at 11 o'clock, which is just under two hours from now. Before getting started and handing things over to Dr. Hui, I want to say a few things about the Sukhai Weishia Collaborative Learning Academic Forum. The Sukhai Weishia Collaborative Learning Project hopes to distinguish itself from some of the less productive conventional practices in contemporary academia. As posted on our website, we are not interested in male peacocks, in jerks, or in any form of egoism or self-promotion. We hope to curb all types of aggressive and look at me, I'm smarter than you, or don't I know so much, and similar types of attitudes that we sometimes see in academic exchanges. The Sahai Weishu Collaborative Learning Project hopes to accomplish these shifts in orientation during academic exchange by encouraging productive communication, humble discussions, real questions, and responses that are open and honest. We hope to foster environments where people truly learn from and with one another. So before handing things over to our chair, let me briefly introduce her. Den Zhe Hui holds a PhD from the Department of Philosophy and Religious Studies at the University of Macau. She will be a postdoctoral fellow at Sun Yat-sen University, perhaps sometime next year. Um, and she's interested in social and political philosophy. Her work focuses on Western conceptions of East Asia and early modern political thought. And her recent publications include From Being With to Public Realm, which looks at Heidegger and Arnett on beach. Um, and then another paper on Enlightenment Toleration, both of which are published in Crede K. So thank you very much, uh, Sandra Hui, for being the chair of this event. I'll let you take over. And thank you very much, Professor Po, uh, for your kind introduction. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Hui Sandra. It's my great honor to uh, have the opportunity to chair this event uh, today. I'd like to welcome you all to this session. Uh, the aim of this session is to discuss Professor Xiang Shu Chen's recently published book. In this session, we will have one speaker to present and uh, three commentators to uh, discuss. We will also have some time for uh, Q&A from the audience. But to begin, I will introduce Professor, uh, the speaker of today's talk, Professor Xiang. Uh, professor Shang is the Moon Hua Professor of Philosophy at Xidian University. She is the author of a Philosophical Defense of Culture Perspectives from Confucianism and Kashir, published by 
uh, the State University of New York uh, Press in 2021, the Chinese translation of this book will be published and entitled Wen Yi Zai Dao, Ru Jia He, Ka Xiar De Wen Hua Zhe Xue. She is also the co-editor of the Islamic Confucian Synthesis in China and the co-editor of How China Shaped the Enlightenment, a transcultural history of modern thought. She is also the translator of history of Chinese philosophy through its key term, terms. In today's session, she will talk about her new book, Chinese Cosmopolitanism, the history and philosophy of an idea, which is published by the Princeton University Press in 2023. The Chinese translation of this book will be published by Zhongxin and entitled now, we are pleased to welcome Professor Xiang. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Hui, and thank you, um, Paul, and um, the team for inviting me, and for the two Dr. Wangs, as well as uh, Dr. Uh, Professor He Jing for um, taking the time to look at my book and to talk to me today, especially to the two professors in America, because it's so early. Um, so I'm very, very grateful. Thank you so much for getting up this early to, to do this. So um, so I'm supposed to uh, give a presentation for 20 minutes to, to talk about my book. So uh, share screen. That, oh, I see it. OK, so. Please let me know if, if um, because I think it's fine. Okay, so um, I will talk for twenty minutes about this, and then we'll have questions. Okay, so I'm not time myself just to, to make sure I, I don't go over time. So um, obviously today we're going to talk about this book that was published at the end of last month. So it just just came out, and it's called Chinese Cosmopolitanism. The history and philosophy of an idea. Okay, so what I'll do today in the 20 minutes that I have will, is first of all talk about uh, why Chinese cosmopolitanism. So broadly, what is the motivation for writing um, a book like this and undertaking the project such as this? Um, what is problematic with existing theories of cosmopolitanism? What is wrong with even the status quo as it exists in the world? And therefore, why we, we need a a Chinese perspective on any of these kinds of issues. So a broad um, outlook on the motivations to frame this kind of project. And then I'll talk to you about the, the synopsis of this book. So the contents, um, the contents of what this book involves, a very brief um, survey of that. And then I'll close by talking about two themes of the book. And obviously I don't have enough time to go through all of the themes, um, in the book, and I'll just pick out two themes. One theme is the conception of the barbarian um, in, the, in the Western tradition, and then in the Chinese tradition, what I call a cultural conception of personhood. And I try to outline what it is I mean by that um, when we say some, um, you have a cultural uh, understanding of what the self is. Okay, so to begin with, um, the broad motivation for, for talking about uh, Chinese cosmopolitanism, what it is I'm trying to challenge. Well, there's this very dominant uh, narrative about why it is that the West came to its position of hegemony. Obviously, we all know that the West is is in this kind of dominant position. It's the sort of the standard by which everything is measured. In, you know, when you do philosophy, um, that's the it's the archetype. It's the standard, and we all know this. Um, but the uh, but then the, what what then is the narrative of how this came to be? How did the West come to this position of dominance? And I don't think anybody has any problems in academic discourse to say that okay, yeah, it's indebted to colonialism um, because of the colonial uh, history of the world that the West uh, well the, this construction of the West um, came to this hegemonic position. Okay, so so far so good. But then you you push further. So why is it, how did um why was it the case that the West colonized everybody else? Why were they the ones who who undertook this colonial mission? And then and then the uh 
it become becomes quite interesting. The the claims that often are made for why it is that the West undertook these colonial missions is first of all that they were more technologically advanced, they were more progressed, more advanced in many senses. Uh, one of them technologically, they were just more progressed. Um, and then, and then another assumption uh, that is often given, or another reason that is given, is that. Well, human beings all want to do this anyway. Everybody wants to dominate each other. Um, that's just the, in our in our genes, you know, the selfish gene, um, this kind of social Darwinist discourse that it's just within human nature that people want to do this. But then it was because um, the West had the most advanced technology, therefore they were able to undertake and realize what was just human human nature anyway. So. Uh, the dominant narrative that we have for um, for why it was the West that colonized everybody, as I write, is man is assumed to be a predator, first of all, whose natural instinct is to kill with a weapon. So human nature is a predator uh, and a predator who uses tools in order to kill. And it was Europe. Uh, who had the most advanced technology. And so they were the most competent at doing this, um, essentially. And the other re and the only reason why other cultures didn't go around doing this was that um, Barbara, they were just technologically too primitive and, pr and, uh, and other kinds of primitivism as well. So that's the kind of dominant narrative. Um, and the, let me summarize this dominant narrative from a passage from, of, of a book called The Eastern Origins of Western Civilization by a scholar called uh, John Hobson, who is, happens to be the grandson of the famous um, author who wrote the book Imperialism, the British historian, John A. Hobson, but this is John M. Hobson, so he's the grandson. And in this book, he writes, one of the key years in the Eurocentric chronology of world history is 1492, the year that Columbus discovered the American continent. And it is taken as axiomatic that the discovery of the world would fall to the Europeans. For by then, only they had developed what Max Weber called a rational restless, restlessness, an ethical world mastery that enabled modern development on the one hand and the conquest of the world on the other. And the most familiar sign of this was Columbus's discovery of America. By contrast, the East was governed by an irrational mindset and long-term fatalism that produced but a passive conformity to and retreat from the world. Thus, its fate was to wallow in economic backwardness and simply wait for the Europeans to discover and emancipate it. And obviously, this kind of orientalizing narrative is very, very pervasive. You see it all the time in places like Hegel um, and his accounts of world history and so forth. So I think we're all quite familiar with that um this kind of account but that kind of account i think is very uh just not true to history um to take th this idea that um the east was underdeveloped and then the west was much more developed that's you know historically we until the 18th century um the places like india and china were I, by all these kind of material standards much much more developed and one indication of this is, uh, one example of this is just the naval capacity that China had in the Ming Dynasty around the same, around the similar time when Columbus um, discovered the American continent. So if you look at the picture that I have, the Junkers ships were just massively bigger than, uh, than the ships that um, Columbus set sail in. So Columbus got money from the Spanish crown, and this is what he had to work with. And when he went around the went around the globe, and you know, obviously, we all know about Junghe, and um, and it's suffice it to say that um, eighty years before Vasco da Gama, the Portuguese um, sailor, uh, rounded the Cape of Good Hope. Uh, Junghe had already reached Kenya, so you know the they had the ships and they were already they were already sailing around the world. Um, and the Chinese ship had 100 ships, the largest of which measured 120 meters, with crews totaling up to 28,000 sailors and soldiers. And that's just incomparable. That it's not it's not um, the what Columbus had to work with is really incomparable to what Junghe had. So um, and it was an armada that was not to be surpassed until the invasion fleets of World War One. So. What this example shows, and there are many, many examples that you can pull to, to show that the East was not, well, China was not technologically um, inferior or primitive in comparison in this period. So, but then we're left then with the question, so if it wasn't 
just a technological advancement that is the answer for why it was that Europe undertook these colonial missions, then what then is is the is the the cause? What's the um, reason for um, why they did it? And then China didn't go around colonizing. And my argument in the book in the book Chinese cosmopolitanism is that. China had a very different kind of worldview to the worldview that the Europeans had. And that's the crucial difference, this difference of worldview and philosophy. And I want to um, just keep us in mind when we talk about the colonial world, it's not an academic, uh, merely very abstract academic point. We always have to keep in mind just how earth shattering an event this was and how much, um, how it changed um, humanity. Um, so one example is on the American continent. So uh, through, you know, Spanish and then later British um, imperialism, up, up to 98% of the people of the American continent were just wiped out. Um, linguists have said that the linguistic diversity of the American continent at the time was um, greater than Europe. So there was many different types different flourishing civilizations and very sophisticated civilizations and those were wiped out um, and then obviously we all know that through colonialism uh, we're left with the legacy of um, the transatlantic slave trade you know the whole African continent was uh, suffered uh, human you know um, systemic human trafficking um, so these things we and then obviously the in Asia Asia suffered as well you know India's um, greatly developed and um, China to some extent as well. So, you know, all of these things we have to keep in mind that it's not some um, uh, purely academic matter that we're dealing with. Okay. So um, now I'll talk to you about the synopsis of the book, how the book lays out its argument and it proceeds in six chapters. The first chapter talks about the um, about a general account of Chinese history. Um, and I make the point that China historically was internally very diverse, actually. Um, and the the Chinese people are really just the amalgamation of the, the peoples in this kind of geographic area. And Chinese culture is also this kind of amalgamation of the of the peoples in this region. And um, externally, China was always aware and in contact with peoples um, from more far away places. And the second chapter talks about the um, the idea, the concept of the barbarian in the Western tradition, and I provide a conceptual account of how this concept evolves throughout throughout European history. Um, and uh, and a big part of my argument in the book is that we really can't understand the nature of colonialism and all of these things that happened unless we have a good grasp on what this icon, what this idea of the barbarian is, and how it how it functions in relation to other um, concepts. Chapter three lays out the uh, the general meta the metaphysics of the Chinese tradition, and by metaphysics, I mean the what how the Chinese perceive the general order of things. And I call this Chinese metaphysics a processual holism, as in it's dynamic, but then all things are related to one another, so you end up having this kind of whole. And this particular, the characteristics of this metaphysics means that um, it endows the Chinese, the Chinese certain kinds of attitudes towards difference. And um, and I by difference I use the example of foreigners and then non-humans such as um, animals and then demons and ghosts. So it's very interesting to look at how you know Chinese texts deal with ghosts. Um, uh, chapter four I talk about the metaphysics of the broad metaphysics of the western tradition and i think that a very a, the very dominant metaphysics is um, that of the great chain of being um in which all things um everything is predetermined to be as it is and then they're also ranked according to hierarchies of worth and this is really the dominant world picture from the greek period through into the medieval christian period and then even into, mod into modernity, the Enlightenment, and arguably even into today. And chapter five and six looks at how um, these differing metaphysical world pictures impacts um, actual practice. So how the Chinese uh, world, um, how its history instantiates some of the those analyses that I made. How how these analyses, how these um, um, particular worldviews end up 
being embodied in in human behavior, in human history, in both the Chinese context and in the in the Western context. Okay. So um, that's a outline of the uh, the main uh, arguments of the book. Okay. So um, like I said, I want to I want to talk about two themes um, in the book. Um, two key concepts. One of them is this idea of the barbarian. And I've written a lot of papers, like, and uh, and, and in this book as well, I keep saying that you cannot translate certain Chinese terms as barbarian because barbarian means something very uh, specific and it plays a particular role in relation to other concepts in, in uh, Western philosophy and Western culture. And it's very, very, very misguided to translate it. Um, to equate it with Chinese terms for foreigners. So for example, the Chinese call people, in the Chinese te history text, they call people around um, around the, the center, si yi, the, the fu, the fu yi, um, or man yi, uh, et cetera. Um, but the, 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 what is important to know is that when you use, when the Chinese use terms like si yi, this is a shorthand for all the peoples that are, actually exist. Well, the you know the tribes that it actually exist, but that's not how barbarian functions. And I want to explain what it is um, is meant by barbarian. So the barbarian is first of all an abstract concept denoting an ontological category, and that ontological category is that of semi-human beings who have no rational agency, who have no potentiality for civilization, who cannot be assimilated into civilization, and who then embodies this kind of mannequin force that seeks to thwart civilization. So that this absolute other um, in, in an ontological sense. Okay. And uh, if I may draw an analogy uh, to explain what, how this, um, uh, how this concept works. So uh, in Kant, Kant when, in his categorical imperatives, talks about humanity. He isn't actually referring to the empirical totality of all human beings. He's not referring to all oh, Africans, Native Americans, Chinese, Indians. He's not referring when he's talking about humanity, that's not who he's referring to. He's actually referring to the rational nature of the human being, as it is this numinal aspect of the human being alone that has absolute worth. So that's what he's referring to when he says humanity, which is what, how then we explain why it is that Kant talks about humanity and the and uh, humanity as having having rights and equal dignity, um, but then but then simultaneously incredibly racist to Native Americans and incredibly racist to Africans, et cetera. Um, it's not a contradiction because he's, he, when, when he talks about humanity, he was never referring to all concretely embodied biological human beings. And um, the barbarian functions similarly. The concept is, fir is first of all a metaphysical concept um, referring to a certain idea and, uh, and that is this, this this kind of quasi humans who have no rational agency, who cannot be assimilated into civilization because they have no potential for it, and uh, who have no potential, who are incapable of rationality. And so there, it's an ontological category of a particular species um, that the concept of barbarian is referring to. Okay, and there's more to the barbarian is a very complex um, concept, and there's more to to it than than what I just described. So. The barbarian is also this kind of Manichaean other who is antithetical to us. So, uh, um, you know, us being the, the civilized. Um, and such that when you destroy the barbarian, we are realizing the so generous, radically autonomous, creatio ex nihilo nature of our civilization. That is, civilization is considered not as continuous uh, with the rest of the world. You know, it's not. Um, is radically transcendent from the rest of the world, and by by destroying this the barbarian, you're you're realizing that radically autonomous nature of civilization. So the destruction of the barbarian destroys actually destroys relations in order in in an attempt to make the civilized exist out of all relationships. So civilization under this view is not a continuum, it, and it's also not caused in the sense of being related by anything else. And um, if I just briefly talk about in the Chinese tradition, in my first book, A Philosophical Defense of Culture, I talk about where the Chinese think civilization comes from. And if you look at the Sitsu in the Yijing, 
it's very clear that they say when when patterning human patterning is this, is continuous with the patterning of the world you know when refers to the patterning of animals and, and so forth so in that sense in that chinese sense civilization is continuous with the natural world you know it's it's, it's indebted to the natural world but in this sense in that in this western sense that i'm talking about is radically actually transcendent um and if i just borrow from the uh, philosopher Lewis, uh, Lewis Gordon, who um, talks about this, what I just said very well, uh, he said, okay, so the Manichaean logic of contraries, uh, uh, so he says, when we impose this kind of idea of barbarian or um, this kind of racial consciousness onto the world, what we're imposing onto rea human reality is this Manichaean logic of contraries, where there are universal separations of positive and negatives that don't meet. The human world, however, is full of contradictions, where interactions always reveal the particularity of false universals. It is dialectical. This means that racism could also be understood as a project of attempting, attempting to eliminate dialectical aspects of human experience. As, dialects, as dialectics are relational, Racism is to force human beings to be non-relational. And that's how the barbarian, you can understand as functioning, is trying to say that, that those who embody civilization um, uh, are not related to, to this, this other that is set up. So um, the barbarian was invented in order to preserve the idea that those who bear civilization can be out of relations with anything, can have a kind of one-way causal efficacy on the world. So, so the civilized act on the world, but then they're not acted on by the world. They're not affected by the world. Um, and so they kind of act like this um, unconditioned creator god or move mover. And then that this idea of civilization can be achieved simply by destroying some putative peoples who represent anti-civilization or the barbarian. Okay. So, and in contrast to, uh, so first of all, I have this uh, concept of the barbarian that I think is very instrumental and very useful for, under, for thinking about why it is that um, the European worldview conducts these um, colonizing missions. Uh, but on the other hand, I think that the Chinese cosmopolitanism can be understood through um, one of the ways it can be understood through is this con cultural conception of personhood. And if I just read this out, so the Confucian Chinese conception of personhood differs from the dominant understanding of self in the Western tradition. In the Chinese tradition, the essence of humanity is something, sorry, in the, in the Western tradition, the essence of humanity is something static that is predetermined prior to the arrival of the self in the world. The human does not differ from the lower animals in being predetermined by their genetic makeup. Indeed, it is precisely the genetic makeup or biological essence that distinguishes them from all other animals in nature. Um, it is for the, you know, you have the human being has reason. That's the this kind of thing that separates them from the rest of the animal world. The animal world doesn't have this kind of um, qu innate biological quality. And in that understanding, that's what separates humans from animals. And it is for this reason that in the history of Western philosophy, you see this obsession with de defining and delimiting the essence that makes humans distinct from the rest of the natural world. Because for, under this view, it's not the process of our acculturation. It's not the fact that you grew up in a certain environment, that you start learning language, that you start learning rituals, that makes you human. But instead, our humanity is reduced to an innate, innate quality, a substance or essence. This conception of personhood is non-relational, what makes one human is a, a priori quality that is static and constant, regardless of the context in which it is placed. You know, it doesn't matter where you put this human, it's, it's always going to be human. Um, and this quality that, that gets called human nature is defined in itself and is conceived by itself. Um, so Latin in, from Spinoza and has a one way causal efficacy in forming the human. So the essence of the human makes the human. It's not anything else that makes it human. Um, and, uh, and, and in contrast, the Confucian Chinese conception of self is a relational one. A self cannot be defined prior to the relationships it partakes of. And these relationships are mediated by the public symbolic uh, system that is culture. It is due to this understanding that the self is formed through socially constructed symbolic nexus that Confucianism traditionally stressed the importance of things like Li and Yu and Wen. And I think that ultimately hum this Confucian understanding of self is much more humanistic because um, it's not fatalistic. The, the human can, can be adapted, can be changed. The human beings have agency to make the human. Whereas in that Western example, the, there's nothing you can do you know, about it. 
Um, and I also think it's more empirical because uh, modern anthropology tells us that it's really this this cultural aspect of the human being is what actually distinguishes it from the the rest of the animal world. Okay, so um, I think I'm, I've gone over my time already. So um, okay, just one last minute. So this is just the kind of the conclusions that I uh, drew from 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 the book. So um, about Chinese cosmopolitanism, I think there's a willingness to hybridize. Um, lack of premium placed on purity, this importance of harmony, this lack of manichae and moral fundamentalist attitude, the kind of processional metaphysics, non-essentialist understanding of self, and attempting to influence people from by being an exemplar as opposed to punishing wrongdoers, seeing power, so doer, not in terms of domination, but as in co-empowerment, co um, acceptance of the conditioned nature of human existence, and then also the lack of desire to transcend this human condition nature, and, and also to this acceptance that um, we are perspectival. And uh, you can see how the barbarian concept informs this, all of this, and the culture understanding of self informs these kind of conclusions. So, so I'll, I'll end it there. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, sorry, I went over a little bit. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Professor Shang. It's very clear and uh, enlightening. Now, uh, let's move to the comment section. Uh, today we have three commenters, uh, commentators. Each of them has 15 minutes to comment and discuss with Professor Xiang. The first commentator uh, is Professor Wang Huayu. Professor Wang is currently a professor of philosophy at Georgia College and the State University. He served as the formal President of the Association of Chinese Philosophy, uh, Philosophers in America. Professor Wang's area of uh, uh, specialization are Chinese and comparative philosophy and contemporary continental philosophy. He has numerous public publications in leading journals and is currently working on a new study and translation of the great treatise of the Yi Jing. Now, I'd like to turn it over to Professor Wang, please. Thank you. Uh, Professor Wang, you need oh, yeah. to... Oh, can I mute? <laughs> I mute myself. Okay, thank you very much. Well, um, I will take this opportunity first to uh, congratulate um, Professor Xiao in uh, public, uh, publishing this very stimulating work. Um, on the very important idea of Chinese uh, cosmopolitanism. Politanism. Um, yeah, um, I, I would, it's a, such a very um, complex and a stimulating idea. I will take the, I will take the um, point of, I think uh, it's a great critique of modern Western um, Hegemonic dimension, I would say, uh, of mod, mod, uh, Western, Western, uh, modern Western universalism. So uh, let's let's think uh, about invite us to, to think or maybe rethink the question of what is truly universal um, in the in the Western civilization, and how is the traditional Chinese idea or traditional Chinese practice of civilization a common or different? From this Western practice, and uh, to maybe uh, a more more stimulating, more peaceful, more harmonious, or is there any common ground? So I think the the idea here is that uh, well, how to think about this idea of humanity as the essence of civilization? What is the essence of kind of humanity? These are all very complex ideas, and uh, I, I agree with. Professor Xiang, that there's a, 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 a deeply uh, disturbing kind of practice in, in modern uh, Western colonization and imperialism, and in, involve a, a huge practice kind of sacrifice of humanity in terms of racism, colonialism, and imperialism. And there is much to think about, about what is the kind of traditional Chinese practice, and how is that, how is that better, maybe? <laughs> Uh, that's uh, that's our argument uh, Xiang is, is trying to establish. How is the Chinese practice of cosmopolitanism better than the Western version 
of cosmopolitanism and what is the essence of humanity and uh, why Chinese metaphysics but not Western metaphysics, <laughs> right? And so, and, and Xiang in his book, in her book uh, established a metaphysical harmony and, uh, and maybe we can rethink about the meaning of harmony and uh, what meaning, true meaning of harmony. And I will, let me start with maybe a, a, um, a thinking about whether, uh, um, you know, the, the interesting thing about the Chinese philosophy is that there is no actually, uh, in, the, in, the, in her, uh, what Chiang just presented is that uh, there is a, well, I would say a, a traditional and modern endorsement of what I would call the right of the might, the right of the might. And uh, in the, it, this is the right of the king and the right of imperialism and to justify the colonialism and the racism and imperialism and with, without regard of the huge sacrifice of human, human life that she presented in his book about uh, like a slave trade and like the sacrifice of native Indian people and the huge practice, uh, huge atrocities along with capitalistic development. Then what is, how is the Confucian idea of cosmopolitanism different than that? And I would say that uh, Maybe the difference, if you look at Chinese history, and it can also be understood as a cosmopolitan because the Chinese understood um, the, the Chinese land, at least, at least the mainland as, as a world. So their world philosophy is, of course, they also saying that you have the, you have, you will have some might, the force in order to kind of, right, to rule the world. And if, without that kind of might, it's impossible. But uh, an interesting difference that you were saying that the Chinese, or what we call the Chinese, never thought that you can rule the world only with the might, but also they have a universal version uh, with, with, with kind of what we call the benevolence, benevolence dimension. And uh, it's interesting to note that the benevolent dimension also in Western practice also. So, so that's our question. It's an interesting question to think about uh, uh, is the, the essential reading, essentialist reading of Western metaphysics and, and the Chinese philosophy, and uh, to think what lesson, but it's more maybe more constructive to think about what lessons we can learn from both traditions to prevent future atrocities. And, uh, and, and, and in my comments to uh, send to Professor Chai, uh, I note that, uh, for example, uh, the professor uh, Jeffrey Sachs <laughs> is uh, one of the most outspoken critique of uh, West um, contemporary Western practices of racism, imperialism, and uh, colonialism. But the Sachs is, regard himself as an Aristotle, Aristotle <laughs> spokesman of Aristotelian virtue. So maybe that we can say that Western metaphysics is not necessary will lead to kind of atrocities. So, and uh, the, the true value of kind of um, Chinese idea um, is that the, kind of the true value of Western metaphysics and, uh, and the true uh, and, uh, and the philosophy and true understanding of Confucian teaching may be that uh, our Think about what is the true idea of Confucian teachings that inform this idea. Maybe that's uh, our site, a, a modern Confucian thinker like Hu Hongming, who, who regards that the essence of Confucian and Western thinking is not a system of moral teachings or, or what we call, call, call ethics, um, but a, a perfect state of temper. And what, what man and as the, as the original state of heart and mind, the perfect, no disturb the state of heart and mind, and uh, of perfect temper and the gentleness in the gentleness of heart and mind, not a metaphysical one of idea of harmony, but the gentle state of heart and mind. That with what we call that wudong and 
how ran chen qi how ran chen qi will also any right power of of this perfect state and temper that's that's i think the essential difference maybe the key difference between the confucian idea that you want to cultivate this perfect state of temper instead of kind of a a, a theory maybe the theory can always manipulate and misuse to justify right but you need you need always to cultivate this perfect state of temper in order to have a, a view a vision of humanity that can lead us kind of beyond beyond this racism and and this, this violence so that's maybe uh well giving my time <laughs> I was saying, um, well, to rethink the idea of the universal, not in the particular metaphysical structures, but in this perfect state of temper, and in, in the idea of gentleness, heart and mind, this perfect state of temper, in and what Manchester would call the oceanic feelings of the righteous power, that's starting from this undisturbed state of heart and mind. I will stop here, give me my time. Professor Shang, do you want to? Yeah. So is it, how many how many minutes do I have to respond? Uh, you have five minutes, uh, five okay. to seven minutes, yeah. So thank you so much, Professor Wang, for your, uh, for your really engaging comments. Um, yeah, so, um, so Professor Wang said that the perhaps the main issue isn't a question of metaphysics, but this so because the key, the central uh, core of Confucianism is this ability to cultivate a kind of attitude to the world, this kind of cultivation of a of the your heart and um, uh, and a kind of gentleness of your heart mind. Um, so what what I would say to I mean, okay, so. Um, so the connection between this and metaphysics is, let me, so as I see it, let me put it this way, um, how metaphysics factors in is, if you look at races, uh, you know, if, for example, a white supremacist in America, they're very, very nice to their family, they're, they're not immoral people. Um, and then the, the question really, in some ways, isn't morality, because, the, because they're to their own people, to their own, you know, to their own kids, to their own families, to their own um mothers they're very very nice they're probably in some by some measure they're incredibly moral people but the problem is that they don't they don't see um other people as part of this humanity and that was the very same problem that existed with Kant you know I think that Kant in some according to his own standards he'd probably be quite a moral person but the problem is that of what he defines as within the bounds of his concern um and um and in my in the book, in that uh, chapter four, processual holism chapter, I talk about this um, uh, the Confucian understanding of Ren, what humaneness, benevolence is Ren, and he and I use the example from I think the Chung, the Chung brothers who said he he used this analogy in medicine. He said that the person who is not Ren, Bu Ren, the Ren, is like there is like they they've got their arms amputated or their arms are paralyzed and they can't feel feel that this arm is a part of them but they, but they're okay with that that's not a young person but that's wrong because actually you obviously your body is a part of you and then and then the um and then the racism in some ways functions very similarly that kind of ideology makes it so that you don't see that other people are actually kind of connected that you're very you know that you're kind of you're connected to them and it's kind of and that in my in Chinese cosmopolitanism, I kind of ultimately attribute this kind of way of thinking, of thinking that other people, uh, you're, you're somehow radically different from other people, and therefore there's this kind of discrete boundary separating you from, from others, as a kind of, um, uh, in Latin you say contemptus mundi, this contempt for the world, because this, this radical desire to, to see yourself as transcendent and then to see you as separate from the natural world. Um, and then that, that which leads to a kind of um, kind of cold heartedness towards the to this inability to empathize with other things because you don't see it as somehow connected to you. It's just radically different. And I think that that's what the metaphysics ends up doing. 
that's the metaphysics is kind of ideology that makes people think that they're not kind of connected to the world. Um, so so that's how I, so that's how I see the the metaphysics as um, as kind of connected to to this. And because what ultimately what Gu Hong, um, you know, this this cultivation of of the heart mind in some ways would be this ability to you know like um, the Wang in Wang Yangming, like he says, okay, you know, the the up the utmost person of Ren, when you see a tile falling from the from the from the roof, oh my God, I feel sad as if like a part of me is hurt. That's what you're supposed to cultivate. But then the problem with why is it that some people can't do that? And I think that it's 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 kind of something that's getting in the way. And then what's getting in the way is a particular system of thought. It's particular metaphysics that's telling you you are more special than the rest of nature. You transcend nature. You're better than everything else, and therefore, you know everything. The human being is the end of all of all natural life. Everything is supposed to serve the human being, you know, and that's the um, that leads to this kind of pathology, uh, pathological inability to 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 see everything as as connected. So, um, yeah. So, if, yeah. But that's how I, I I think of the metaphysics as connected to to it. So thank you. That's yeah. Thank you, Professor Zhang and Professor Wang. Thank you for your discussion. Uh, now I will introduce the second um commentator. Our second commentator is Professor Robin Wang. Professor Robin Wang is a professor of philosophy and the director of Asian Pacific Studies at Loyola Marymount University, located in uh, Los Angeles in USA. She is the author of Yin Yang, The Way of Heaven and Earth in Chinese Thought and Culture. She is also the editor of Chinese Philosophy in an Era of uh, Globalization and Images of uh, Women in Chinese Thought and Culture, writing from pre-Qin period to the Song Dynasty. Uh, she has published many articles and regularly has given presentation uh, in North American, Europe, and Asia. All right, now I'd like to turn it over to Professor Robin Wang, please. Thank you, Xian Zhen. Okay, I want to celebrate uh, um, Xiang Chen's uh, incredible interesting insightful book. There's really the book often uh, open up an intellectual space um, for exploring also uh, comparative philosophy. So I think it's really bring out a, a missing voice. So um, there, this book itself, it's intersect with intellectual history, uh, history in terms of global encounters and the philo philosophy. So my things I wanted to um, pick up three very important philosophical problems. Um, I see what uh, uh, Xiang Chen is doing, but uh, and also mostly I want to come up in relation. I have uh, three questions for uh, Xu Chen. Sorry, uh, I, I, Xiang Chen. Sorry. Okay, so one philosophical problem is the differences. So how should we philosophically dealing with differences, right? Differences, it, it's not it's person, culture, tradition, so forth. So uh, Xu Chen did it from, Xiang Chen, sorry, so to, to from the metaphysical view of otherness or differences that divided these philosophical traditions. So she did this idea of fundamental problem, substantial ontology with the procedures ontology. So that's very interesting. I think it's a fundamentally trying to solve this problem. Another question is racism and pluralism. So as I, this is a quote from book, she said, this project is much is as much about understanding Western racism as it is about understanding Chinese pluralism. So I think this uh, it's a uh, uh, good way to compare good way to thinking about this uh, both issues racism because the chinese don't feel like they have the problem with racism but the chinese instead have this pluralism so how we understand this 
The third thing is, is the cosmopolitanism. I think this is um, very interesting and uh, help us also trying to really understand. There is an incredible um, a practical implications like China um, rise and then people worry, concerned whether China will be invaded and will be. So they somewhat using Western metaphysical assumptions to impose to Chinese mind, or Chinese way doing things. So therefore, uh, it's dangerous and problematic. Okay, I'm now I'm come to a specific questions for uh, Shu Chen, Xiang Chen. Sorry, I always because I have a friend, uh, you know, uh, Sun Xiang Chen. Now I have, so I'm a little better. Usually make mix up these two names. Okay. So the question one, so is there a movement? So from metaphysics to normative or practical uh, problems. So the question I ask is the part of differences problem. So, and then there is also a, a problem of how to resolve conflict. So I feel that there's a metaphysical uh, assumptions um, could lead to action aggression. So the question is aggression is a problem. So my focus is on how to solve the a conflict. I feel like if you maybe we're going to Dao might be have more resources to work with. Here's a statement. For example, B is different than A. Therefore, B should be eliminated by A. So this, I think, is what this we see in the history in European. You 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 talk in the age of discovery, usually doing that. You're different than us. You barbarian, so we need to be limited. You need to be limited. Now another statement. So B is different than A. Therefore, B should be transformed, jianghua. This is, we see in the history, how Chinese, are especially Confucian, dealing with others, right? So this is one thing. Then they could be also gong chu. This is a, a coexist harmoniously. This is Taoist approach. We can to present a lot of situations uh, in um, Taoist resources. So. So my question, first the question is um, how to dealing with conflict and based on your procedural um, uh, substantial uh, metaphysics, if I see, uh, uh, procedural um, metaphysics. So is there aggression is a problem. Second question, I want to see how far the theory of harmony can go or should go, right? So I do see you you celebrate the Chinese idea of harmony. I think it's good. Harmony is a good value or desirable state of being. But harmony has its own limitations. And this limitation from different ways. Now I do give a concrete example, uh, examples. So I will see, do you see an uh, existential danger in the problem of harmony? So, because harmony, think about the implies that parts must be submitted or sacrificed for the whole. So, you are fully aware of the fact that today, I'm looking about today, that a female scholar's condition, working condition in China, particularly in philosophy field, those male scholars they are reasonable, rational be, but why they do not see the lack of female presentations is a fatal problem for the, to the, in the field. You can see more or the more, right? So all this important conference, important event, all there is no female representations. The problem is also why most uh, uh, established well-liked, influential male scholars so blind to this. I talk to them, but they, I don't think they want to intentionally suppress the woman, but they 
also thinking about, you know, woman has its place, and this place not necessarily for, uh, a in philosophical field. Right. So, so the, another word, what's saying? They think they are legit. They they think this is valid. A uh, woman has this particular place, and outside the philosophical field, field. So, one of the things I feel like they like to cultivate those stiff. Um, I I do so. One of the reasons they will say, "Well, woman, you know, um, not good enough." But it's why you not cultivate, help them mentor them. So the question is, they rather to give stupid men a chance and they don't offer a chance for a woman to be stupid. Let's maybe as I say, I, it's an opportunity issue. So so this is what I was thinking about opportunity issue. But this opportunity issues have going much deeper than simply just a uh, um, gender issue. I think there is backed up by philosophical assumption, sense of harmony. Everyone plays its own role. Okay, so so that is one thing I want to, but I also um, want to quickly uh, make comments. You use Kant, Kant example, talk about Kant, Kant's universality, not including all kind of human beings, including the um, like a slave or so forth. But I also think a Confucian's idea, you know, Xinren or Jinzi is not necessarily inclu including very low, um, I would say, farmers, right? So it's a stash, it's, it's an educated elite. So they all seem to have a problem. But Kantian's, you know, the Kantian's idea, let's say, categorical imperative, some word applied to today could be they using that woman could use that as the advantage. So, but anyway, this is more complicated. So this is a, a second question I have. Now, third question, I this is coming really into um, specifics. And today I also see quite a bit of faculties um, and the invest um, here. So I, I I'm not sure whether uh, you're familiar right now in your in the uh, US also in the world have this called the DEI project in you 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 in US campus called the Di diversity um, e um, equity and the inclusion right so um, this is had very hard especially in philosophy field in my department it's, it's it's really uh, have a very hard uh, resistance to, to this DEI project. So I'm wondering, do you have any kind uh, advice or what you see from a philosophical point of view? What kind of philosophical reasoning you could um, maybe offering and oh, you can uh, help us to thinking through why we need right diversity, equity, and inclusion, based on um, Chinese cosmopolitanism. So that's that's something. Maybe this is too much to ask, but I think it's kind of thought experiment. It's kind of fun to think to think something. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor. This is such interesting questions. I wish we had uh, more time to, to discuss them all. Um, okay, so uh, the first question was the question of how to address conflict from the Chinese perspective. How would you address conflict? So you presented three different um, solutions. One, you eliminate it. Uh, secondly, you transform it, which is the, the Confucian view of jiao hua. And then you say that there's a Taoist alternative of coexistence. So I think that within the within the Confucian tradition, so if you look at the Li Zhu, they talk about just letting people be as well. You could say that they have that kind of Taoist attitude as well. People have different, they say su, people have, have different su. And then they, they say there's a, and then there's that kind of perspectival nature to that. The, the people who live in those regions, they, the landscape and then the food, they're suited to it. And so they form particular soul and then 
the Nizi, when was talking to, about the king, the king should just kind of leave them to do that. So I think there is that aspect to there. And then I think that kind of attitude that you talk about coexistence is especially clear in the uh, finance, uh, which is very critical of Confucianism. And but that's much more clear that you should just, um, you know, the Confucians think you think you have ritual, but then the, the other people have, and the, the ritual works just as well uh, for, for, for their own particular location. Um, so first of all, I think the Confucians have somehow that kind of attitude of coexistence. And then with the with regard to Jiaohua, I think so. In my ideal reconstruction of Confucianism, is it's this this kind of question of self critique. Um, really, the, the 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 best kind of efficacy, the best kind of doula, uh, is is Wu Wei, is non action. And then in in practice, what you how you're supposed to achieve that is just just through self critique. Um, and then Mencius, when he says, "Okay, so when I when I meet um, somebody and then they they they're rude to me, I, I just self-examine. I examine myself. Did I do anything wrong? And if I examine, I didn't do anything wrong. Then I just let let it go. I just leave it. And then the the, the I think the thought here is that if you if you met with a kind of um, non-idealistic situation, a problematic situation, the only thing that are kind of morally um, pref- kind of well cultivated person should do is reflect on themselves. Did you do anything to contribute to the non ideal nature of the situation? And if you find that you hadn't done anything wrong, you just move on. And then, and then there's a very idealistic thought that one day people will be be drawn to that kind of moral behavior. Um, there is some, there was going to be something something affective about that kind of exemplary behavior, and then people will then fall to, fall to you, and then. Uh, and then this, the image of that kind of worldview is embodied in Analex 2.1, when Confucius says that the um, the person of Dua is like a North Star, uh, like the, and then he does nothing, and then everything falls around him. And I think that that's the kind of thinking here that um, you, the, the truly efficacious, and remember that in Chinese, Dua means both power, efficacy, um, uh, moral behavior, virtue, and that, that's all connected. Um, and then so Professor Wang has, a, Wang Hai actually has a, has a really nice paper about that, which um, I was actually quoting a while ago. Um, so uh, he said, is it you, sorry, Professor Wang Hai, you were in that, the true source of inspiration for moral actions of a Confucian personality must come from the magnificent, magnificent life of, sorry, that's the wrong one there. Uh, sorry, just give me one second. I was quoting it the other. Um, so you said, okay, uh, dua consists of cultivating empathy and reciprocity, and political power rests on the ability of political leadership to foster the cohesive power of communal attachment and collaboration. So I think that when you when you self critique and stuff, that that's that that's what ends up ha- what's end up um, being cultivated. Other people kind of be drawn to you. Um, so I think that's the ideal version of how to deal with conflicts. That um, ultimately you shouldn't you just shouldn't be thinking in the mode of trying to punish other people because it's not sustainable. I mean, in the short term, maybe it works. I mean, very pragmatically, I think that in the short term, okay, it could choose something, but you cannot think of that as a strategy in the long term. In the strategy, the only thing that will work is if you kind of embody good behavior. Um, and I and I think that that's. Um, if we're being charitable to Confucianism, I think that that's the essential insight that the only truly sustainable way to behave um, is is self reflection and to embody good behavior yourself. And then that, and then and then because everybody has Langzhi, you know, that's also an assumption of Confucianism. Everybody's then going to be affected by this, um, um, uh, by you being able to benefit other people. Okay, so um, that's my attempt at the first question. So to start with the second question. How far should um how many do? So I'm obviously I feel very very uh in keenly the problem that Professor Wong talks about the the kind of, kind of very kind of out of hand unhinged sexism in China. But I think that that kind of attitude where in which women has a place works much more like the kind of metaphysical determinism that I talk about as a as a kind of great Chinese being that everything has this kind of place. I think if we're being truly re- real to what harmony means in in the Chinese, that's not that's not harmony. That's not what I mean by harmony. Um, 
by how many, if I might use a metaphor from architecture, because I used to, I studied architecture, and to be a really good architect is actually kind of being able to create harmony, because, you, for example, if you, you're, you're given a brief, so if there, oh, you have to build a school, there's an old tree here, which you can't move, uh, cars move here, and then the building has to be four foot tall, uh, four stories high, and then that you have to house 500 children. With all of these 1,000 problems, how do you create something that is meaningful and elegant, given all these constraints? And then that requires a huge amount of creativity, which is why there are better architects and there are worse architects. The best architects create, create order out of out of the given constraints. And I think that that's, that's harmony of words. I mean, you, you're able to use these constraints to, to, the, to their advantage. Okay, you have this old tree here, make that into something a key aspect of your design you know that doesn't have to be a problem and then i think that is more like what harmony should be you, you get you're given constraints but then you make something creative out of it it's not that there's a formula for, for things you know an architect doesn't just say you, you don't have a computer program for how to design buildings that would be much more like you know women have their place they always do this that's a formula that's you know harmony has to always be dynamic and creative i mean you know that kind of thing is just isn't for me according to my understanding it's not even it's not, that's just not harmony um so they have to, to the to those men you don't haven't even understood chinese philosophy so whatever um <laughs> and then um this question of um how could you the, 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 in confucianism you talk, there's this kind of elitism about shengren the shengren is not um the farmer would never be shengren the farmer would never be junzi yeah and i think that the Elitism is um, is a is something very dangerous in Confucianism, um, and it does. And I think the the this is the, the kind of like more Zhong uh, um, Tai Confucians would kind of grab onto that kind of elitist thinking. But I don't think that's the most um, uh, creative, insightful way to think about Confucianism. Um, and I think that. Um, the difference between the Kantian, that kind of Kantian elitism, is that a woman can never not become a, you know, this comes very racist, sexist to women. Yeah, you know, a, a woman can never become a man, well, unless they have a sex change. But the, the thing is, for a farmer, the, there's always the chance that one day they can become a junta. You know, that, that's kind of the difference. The hierarchy is social as opposed to kind of this kind of ontological hierarchy. So that's what makes it a little bit better. Um, but obviously, I, I, I do know, I, I think that the elitism is um, kind, of, kind of dangerous and it can often fall into something um, not good. And, um, and okay, so, and then I just, so, sorry, I'm going over, but sorry, you're, <laughs> um, and then the, 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 you said that the Kant, we can use this idea of rights, basically, the kind of Kantian idea of rights to, to, for people to their advantage, which I agree with, but um, which, I, which is why I think identity politics is a good thing. Um, it, it, short, of some, short of something else, at least you have identity politics, at least you can appeal to that. So I do think, I do think it's a good thing, but I think it can only be a short term, sh short gap thing. It can never, be, it's not a long-term solution to things. And um, because, uh, well, let me just briefly say this. The, 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 there's a history to this kind of Kantian idea of, um, well, everybody gets to gets to be recognized. The ethics of recognition, the politics of recognition that Charles Taylor uh, works on a lot. And in that paper that Charles Taylor wrote about recognition, he traces it. Where does this idea that everybody is equal of recognition come from? He says it comes from like in the modern period, for starting from Rousseau, which Kant then picks up on. But prior to that, only the feudal lord is owed recognition. Only the lord is owed recognition. But then somebody like Rousseau just wants to wants to kind of like sort of multiply that to everybody but but i think that ultimately the problem with that is how can some recognition in some ways is maybe a kind of finite resource that it's very different when just what all the, your feudal serfs owe recognition to one lord and now you're saying that everybody in the world can, can does that you know does it can you does it even just work to just multiply this in that way and and i think that's really a real question whether you can just you know, we have one thing multiply. Does that still work? You know, in that and on that kind of scale. Um, and then, okay, so and then, um, and then the question about diversity, equality, and inclu inclusion. Why? Why should we um, have? 
so if I was going to talk to the people who are very reluctant to do it, very reluctant to, to include it. But I actually want to use a quotation from James Baldwin, which I used in the book. So James Baldwin, the civil rights activist, he said, um, uh, he said, well, I'm, I, me and my ancestors were all part of America, but, and if America cannot come to accept the fact of this history, the fact of the, about this reality, the very people who are excluded from the American dream by their very presence will wreck it. And he means that you just have to deal with the fact that the world is diverse. If you cannot deal with reality, then the reality is going to just like, your, your, your ideal cannot your idea cannot withstand the force of reality so you just have to deal with reality and the reality is that we're all internal to each other all civilizations are internal to each other um there is difference there is diversity and then you just have to deal with it and if you can't deal with it then you you cannot you cannot sustain yourself either that's that's like a kind of broad philosophical um answer to that so so thank you so much that's my thank you Thank you, Professor Shang and uh, Professor Robin Wang for your discussion. Uh, now, uh, I will introduce our third commenter, uh, Professor He Jing. Professor He Jing is a professor of philosophy at East China Normal University. She works in the fields of philosophy of mind and uh, social cognition with a, specific, uh, with a particularly focus on uh, cl cletic, uh, collective uh, inter intersectionality, embodiment, and re-identity. Now, Professor He, you will have the floor, please. Thank you, Xianzhe, very much for your kind introduction. And uh, first of all, con big congr congratulations on your new publication. And it was a wonderful book. And I read through, I really benefit a lot. And I really appreciate a lot of your argument and details. And um, uh, I'm sorry, I'm not really into this area. So I may not able to provide as so much um, constructive comments as uh, to Professor Wang's, but I do have like a couple of questions. If you can share your insights with me, I would be very much um, appreciate. So uh, the first question is, I, uh, I in your presentation, I totally agree with you. You said that the four Yi and the, the Man Yi are not real barbarian. But I'm wondering what is the case in Shang Dynasty? So as we know, the conquest and the replacement of the Shang Dynasty by the Western Zhou was not only a simple dynastic region change, and but also a milestone revolution in the history of Chinese civilization. So the order and the culture of the Shang dynasty did not leave much influence and the trees in later generations of China. And instead, it was the Zhou dynasty that replaced it and systematically constructed the basic character and social order structure of the traditional Chinese culture. But I think that it was to notice that there was more or less a custom of um, sacrificing people to please a god. So under that level of social civilization at that time, and human sacrifice was kind of a religious ritual that quickly built the ethnic self-identity. To, um, to put it simply, um, the one who used the living as a sacrifice is the merchant race as the ruler and overlord. And the one who is sacrificed as a sacrifice is the side who is conquered and ruled. So that is the in uh, farrier foreigners. So uh, conquering neighboring nations through war and then offering prisoners of war as a sacrifice to their god and ancestors was also a way of Shang nations to show their uh, superiority. So I'm wondering if at that stage, um, in the very specific time of um, uh, Shang dynasty, uh, there might be the ideal, uh, ideology of barbarian that uh, in your sense. So um, this is my first question. And the second question is, um, I really appreciate your claim that racism is a culturally specific phenomena and ideology. And I think that you also let us clearly aware that throughout the Chinese history, whatever alien culture element, uh, 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 elements were accept, uh, acceptable to our human moral nature and would be tolerated and uh, assimilated. 
But however, I'm wondering this uh, simulation is an, a kind of undifferentiated way or it should presuppose the basic distinction between self and other. So if it is a case of later, and how can we return, retain the self-identity and also at the same time adopt each other's culture and history as their own? Um, I think it will not be a prominent problem when Chinese culture is super to the other cultures. So for example, like in Song, uh, in Tang, and in early Ming Dynasty. But, but what if the other way around, for example, like in the late Qing Dynasty at the late of 19th century, and we realize that modern, si modern science has made the Western civilization really powerful. So it seems like we were facing the struggle of, you know, trying to keep the balance of retain our own uh, 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 identity and also uh, kind of, you know, adopt the culture and learn from others. And this is my second question. And my second question, uh, my third question is, um, um, it seems like the uh, the self and other generation that you talked about the um, the the, the uh, native and also the aliens um, in the uh, general sense of like more like the kind humankind category. So I'm wondering if this pattern in China can be you know transferred to the individual level of daily interaction. So suppose like when I in interaction with you, would that be also you know obey the pattern between you know our nation to interact with the nation of others? Thank you. Sorry, can, I, I don't think I understood the last question. Could you just explain that? When, so when I um, when we in daily encounters, how? Yeah. So so I'm I, I'm just thinking that you describe a pattern that how our culture could be associated with the other cultures when other cultures is different from ours. So what 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 about the case like in our daily encounters between the specific individual level of self and other? Would that pattern you know automatically you know impact and uh, you know kind of shift the way that we interact with each other? Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, okay, so thank you for um. So the, with regard to the first question about the the Shang Dynasty, um, and this I really don't know. I just have to. I I don't know because the Shang. I I only look at um the the. the the texts that are written, you know the and then the Shang books. Um, so, so I I don't really. I think they have oracle book. Uh, I think that you know that when they make their prognostication, they uh, so there's that. But it's um, you don't really have a systematic um, kind of um, text that would describe what their kind of worldviews were. And so, and I think um, I think I, I'm still ultimately kind of like as discipline, more like a, a kind of philosopher. So. Um, I think that kind of you, you might need to kind of be a kind of archaeological training to to kind of infer what the world these were from the kind of material practices, the kind of instruments that they left behind and so forth. Um, so so that's just I'm just unfortunately ignorant about about that. Um, and uh, and then um, but I think that I mean. I mean, I, but the thing is, I, I think it's very possible that they they had a very they had a different kind of worldview to the to the Joel. You know, that there does seem from the material practices, there does seem to be a kind of break. So, um, but I, I mean, so when in my book, I'm really only dealing with uh, the from the kind of the Joel onward, the, the the text that you're left with, and then because they recorded everything, so you can just look at the, the, the things that they recorded, the history. Um, and then so so this question of whether okay so because the they 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 use humans they conquered other people and used the the people that they conquered as human sacrifice could this be seen as an example that they had a concept of the barbarian I mean possibly it's possible but the but the thing is there's a lot of be there's some behave um there's a lot of human history in, in throughout human history everybody people kill a lot of people, you know, you know, like I, I, the Europeans, it was terrible. It was a huge amount of people killed, but like other people kill people for, you know, for reasons too, you know, a lot, the Mongolians killed a huge amount of people. When the Qing came, came to China, they, they killed a huge amount of people. 
the, the fact that they killed people doesn't necessarily mean that they they were operating on the on the basis of that ideology. I mean, I personally don't think that the Mongolian, even if they killed so many people, I don't think that they 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 actually had a concept of, of race because they're much more pragmatic. As long as you as long as you um, let let them rule over you, that they 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 generally let you let you be. Um, um, and so, so, so it's very. I think from the very fact that they sacrifice people and stuff, it, it, you, you couldn't say just from that that they had this conception of barbarian. They could have, but I, I just, I think there's different. There's a lot of reasons why people kill other people. I mean, just to like as a show of force to intimidate you into submission. You know, um, that's not necessarily racial. Um, okay, and then so the question is. How, of how how to draw the line, the balance between how retaining one's self identity and and uh, um, and learning from other people. Um, I think that's um, um, I mean I I don't I, I think that if you're coming from a position I don't this isn't necessarily a philosophical point but I think that if you're coming from a position of of um this just a, this is very it's very different when you're when you're okay with who you are and then you you try to learn from other people you, you're learning things to enrich yourself and then you don't lose yourself as a, that, this is just talking about like as on from a personal level um it's very different to to just not have a sense of self and to just copy everything and then and then to have completely lost your sense of self then you you already knowing who you are and then you're trying to um uh trying to you know travel the world see more things meet more people and then learn from other people um i just think that that's the two very different experiences and i i can't quite think on a philosophical level how that would be i just think from a personal level i think it's very intuitively clear how it, when when you're you know if you're just like a teenager and you don't know who you are yet it's very clear when they're just copying their friends or something and then somebody who's very mature and already knows who they are and then they 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 have the humility to learn from other people i think this is just phenomenologically very different and i i, I can't think how to describe that on a philosophical level um and then on the on the um on the on the human to human level so can can this question of learning from other people be uh be applied to the human level i think very much so i think that um so in the analects the uh, confucius said you know science in be or so you know it, every time you meet another perspective that's always a chance to improve yourself because when in that quotation when when he said um it's uh he says i learned from the good behaviors of the other person and when i see bad behaviors in the other person i reflect on myself to make sure i'm not doing it so again it's not there's never this tendency in confucianism to go to to sort of um to punish some somebody you think is doing wrong it's always this the availability of other perspectives is always a chance for self-improvement and I think that that so on that personal microcosm level, it's uh, it's true. And on the more macro level between different cultures, it's the, I think it's the same um, same philosophy. Yeah. So thank you, thank you very much for your questions. And uh, thank you, Professor He and Professor Xiang for your discussion. I learned a lot from your discussion. Uh, before we move on to the next section, I have two quick quick questions for Professor Xiang. <laughs> um, the first question is, uh, uh, you mentioned the term of mannequin, and uh, you also discussed that uh, in, in your uh, in your talk, you also discussed the uh, religious and the mysterious uh, factors also contributed to the different ways uh, to deal with the uh, difference and the uh, other between these two traditions, Chinese tradition and Western tradition. Uh, could you explain a little bit more about this point? Uh, or uh, could you give us uh, a specific example? Uh, for, for example, you mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, Chinese uh, we Chinese have a, a different uh, way to mm -hmm. deal with the ghosts 
and spirit. Could you give uh, uh, give us an example to explain this point? This is the first question. The second question is that uh, it's about uh, you know the uh, in Western history. Uh, there are some philosophers such as Pierre Bell, uh, Voltaire, and Leibniz. Uh, they also realized the, the achievements of uh, uh, Chinese thought and the practice uh, in moral education, in politics, and uh, historical recorders, and so on, based on the missionaries' uh, accounts. The knowledge of others, especially China, also contributed to the formation of uh, uh, their own theory and uh, also the development of uh, European Enlightenment. So, uh, do you think uh, emphasizing this underestimated, you know, self-reflective di dimensions in this, you know, Enlightenment philosophers' works also uh, help us or help people to face the challenge of uh, uh, racism? Uh, that's my question. Thank you. I don't. I think I didn't understand the second question. So the uh, understanding the self reflection help. Oh, sorry, can you just? Uh, because uh, uh, you know, in the Europe during the uh, Europe Enlightenment, the thinkers also realized that you know uh, other traditions they also have some uh, achievements in their um, practice or in their thought. They also use this, uh, you know, use this knowledge to reflective you know their own thoughts and practice uh, okay. at that time i'm just wondering you know whether this can you know re-examine these uh, works or these philosophers accounts can help us to face you know the challenge of uh, racism that's my question okay okay yeah i think I'm, yeah okay so um thank you for your question so with regard to the first question about the manichaeanism and how this um, plays out with the Chinese attitude to ghosts. Yeah, this is so fascinating because I was, um, because you know, what I what I noticed was, if you look at um, anti-Semitic, I wrote a paper about this in Asian philosophy, the ghostly other. Um, if you look at anti-Semitic discourse in the Nazi period, the way they describe the Jews is that they're undead, that they're kind of like ghosts and then they, they haunt the world and um, they're kind of like, uh, yeah, the, the, they're uncanny. They kind of like does a heimly. So they're very like un uncanny. They're like um, they're kind of like humans, but they're kind of kind of not. And then they're very much like they always describe as kind of the undead, like kind of like a ghost. And so I was like, oh, cool. So how does how does that play out in China? Then what did the Chinese think about ghosts? And then like I read like Lao Jai Zhi Yi, like so I was like, okay, cool. I just read like Lao Jai. But I I think what you and very interestingly find and I will say and I talk about that in Chinese cosmopolitanism is much more kind of naturalism because the ghost in in the um in the western why they so feared the ghost was because it was um it was not part of nature it's somehow it's that's why they're so scary because it's it's kind of trans it's supernatural you know that's in, in English you say it's, it's super, the ghost is supernatural they're above the nature and then that's why they're so scary um but then in China it's it's and, it, and Zhu Xi, also, I talk about this in the book, the Zhu Xi also says that ghosts are nothing but qi, you know, they're just different formations of qi. So this is understanding that ghosts are also just kind of part of nature. Um, and um, and the, I quote, and I talk about the story, um, Nye Xiao Tian, um, who they, and they made movies about this. And Nye Xiao Tian in Lao Zhai Zhi Yi, she, it's so important, it's, the story is impossible under Western kind of metaphysics because okay, so she's a ghost, and you she's a ghost, and she falls in love with um, who's the actor? He killed himself. The Liang Xin. No, anyway, he um, so he she falls in love with the scholar, and then she follows him home, and then, like she starts eating human food, and then she starts like um, hanging out with the family, and then she starts becoming human again. And then she like, and then she has babies with him. So, so it's just like, and then that I use that story to talk about the the kind of the processional nature of uh, Chinese metaphysics that things are all can change. This is I think is a great example of this idea that things are always changing. Or if you, according to the environment, you give it the right kind of environment, it will become become a certain kind of thing. But then obviously in the in that kind of Western metaphysics, it's 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 according to essences. If you if you have the essence of something, that is 
the, the environment can't change. If you put it in a different environment, it's always going to be there. And so I, so my, I use the example of the ghost to talk about, to, to show the characteristics of this kind of Chinese kind of metaphysics. And I think it's really, first of all, that um, things always change. And then this attitude of ghosts is very naturalistic. It's everything, there's nothing that escapes Tao. Everything is Tao. Um, there's nothing that is, is, transcends Tao. Um, so, uh, so, that's, so, that's, so that's why the ghost thing is really funny. And then this, this thing about the Enlightenment. Um, see, yeah, the Enlightenment thinkers borrowed a lot. Yeah, like you said, Voltaire, he was like really interested in Confucian ethics. But um, there, there's a lot of people who borrowed a huge amount from, from, um, from China. And I think this is not actually well known at all, which is why I'm, I'm co-editing a volume with um, my co-author called Martin Powers. He's, that, he's a professor at the University of Michigan. Um, he's actually visiting professor in PK Beijing University now. And um, he's written a lot of books um, about how much the enlightened, I mean, the, the Europe had the idea of aristocracy. They didn't have idea of meritocracy. And he shows how, how difficult it was for Europeans to have this idea that, wow, you rule because of merit. They couldn't understand that. But there were several, the several steps they had to make before they finally understood this kind of Chinese idea because they had this feudalism, you know, the aristocrats rule. And um, and then they had, and then it's really these kind of ideas that came over that really made, really have to say, con contributed a great deal to to the Enlightenment. You know, China played a huge role in the Enlightenment, and it's not very well known. Um, uh, a lot of these kind of these ideas, especially about nobility, um, um, and others as well. So. So I so that's what I try. What we are trying, if I understood your question right, that is what we're trying to do in our co-edited volume is to say that cultural progress always comes as a result of interaction. We're not saying that China had all the great ideas. It was not. That's not what we're saying. We're saying that you know, human humans beings make progress when we interact with each other, and civilized cultures have to engage with each other because his, you have to look at it historically. The, the big leaps in in European history, okay. the Renaissance. Enlightenment. That was because you were you. The Europe. I think the Enlightenment's indebted to colonialism. They were first. They, they, they now they had access to all this kind of different. Knowledge. There's a book called the The Dawn of Everything by David Graeber. He was an anthropologist who recently died. He wrote he wrote Debt the first five hundred years. Um, he says American ideas of democracy is indebted to the Native Americans because the founding fathers were having to first for the first time justify their kind of rule, the aristocratic rule to the natives who had a much more kind of egalitarian um, understanding of how to rule. And then and then he's saying that these kind of interactions spurred on the, the, the kind of con the kind of constitutional thinking and so forth. And I think that that is very much true for a lot of not, you know, not just with European engagement with China, it's any kind of cultural progress is, is a result of like the Confucius science being the you're always learning from other people. So, um, so yes, I think this stressing that uh, human progress always comes from interaction is is something that um, helps hopefully um, mitigate against that kind of chauvinism that one group of people have the best ideas. That's not true. That's not true for China. It's not true for anybody. Thank you. Thank you for your answer, Professor Shang. It's very instructive. Uh, now let's move on to the next part, the discussion part. Uh, do you uh, do does anyone has any questions? I see uh, one question from uh, Britt Davis. Uh, do you want to turn on your mic, Professor Britt Davis, in the chat box? Um, uh, sure. Hello. Can you hear me? Okay. Um, thank you. I'm, I'm afraid I had four questions, so it might be you know, hard to. Uh, it's very stimulating. I'm very, very interested in, in your project and really looking forward to reading the, um, the book. Um, but, you know, so thinking takes place through kind of critical self-questioning as well. So these are the questions I'm asking myself as, along with you uh, and, and listening to your presentation today. One is um, it, the, the critique of the Western traditions being Manichaean uh, I think is very um, pertinent and and um, convincing. Uh, 
but I wonder if the the approach that you're presenting, maybe at least in in just the uh, the summary form today, is itself Manichaean, because it seems like everything that you refer to with the Western metaphysics and political philosophy is problematic, but everything that you refer to with regard to Chinese metaphysics and political philosophy is good. Uh, th that I, I really liked what you were just saying about uh, uh, cultural hybridization and and interaction and mutual influence. Uh, uh, but I didn't quite hear that. I didn't hear that in, in the in the presentation. And so the second question also relates to that, because the very concept of cosmopolitanism, of course, is a is a very Western concept, with a very particular history. Uh, and so even the kind of tension between the two terms, Chinese cosmopolitanism, raises a lot of questions for me. Um, what you were just saying, though, about the interaction makes a lot of sense that you could put, you know, the really positive aspects of uh, Western tradition of cosmopolitanism together with the positive aspects of the Chinese um, uh, political philosophy, history of political philosophy, to come up with a new hybrid, very interesting, you know, and, uh, and, and convincing form of cosmopolitanism that maybe we don't want to call it just Chinese anymore. Maybe we want to call it intercultural cosmopolitanism or something like that. Uh, but that's my second question. Why use the concept of, of cosmopolitanism, which is a very Western concept, uh, when I don't hear you appreciating much about the history of Western political philosophy? Uh, the third question then is, um, the cosmopolitanism is one of these concepts that Western political philosophers have used to self-critique. Uh, and the ability, the uh, the stress on uh, capacity for self-critique is very important in the Western uh, tradition. And so cosmopolitanism from the beginning, uh, right, with Diogenes, is a self-critique, right? It's a critique of what's going on around, around them uh, in the Western tradition. Uh, and so I'm wondering, how would you use your new conception of Chinese cosmopolitanism to critique what's going on or what what went on, especially in recent history in, in China. Uh, so could you use that concept, Chinese cosmopolitanism, to say, hey, uh, there's lots of problematic stuff going on um, in, in, in China and in, in China's approach to the rest of the world um, in the past you know, 100 years or so, say. Uh, and then finally, uh, with regard to the cultural interaction, I totally agree with you that that's where really good stuff happens <laughs> when you put you know, the best of different worlds together and you start really creatively thinking in those interstices, those spaces of interaction. But there's also bad influence, right? I mean, there's also pernicious influence. And, uh, you know, the Chinese culture, Chinese society today is, is uh, very different than Chinese society culture was uh, 200 years ago, say. Uh, and the major difference, right, is, is the Western influence, everything from, from communism to capitalism and, and uh, you know, everything from clothing to, to manners to, you know, to academic customs and so forth. And so I'm wondering, uh, has, since you really highlight and, and explain to us a lot of really problematic aspects of the Western tradition, has China inadvertently imported any of these problematic aspects? And so does now the, the self-critique uh, within China also need to, to engage with these problematic um, strands of the Western tradition that have been imported? Thank you. I'm sorry. It's a lot of questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, These are very super interesting questions. Um, so the, the, the first question, so I think there's one, two, three, five questions. So the first question was, um, is it too Manichaean to set up the West, Western metaphysics bad, Western politics bad, Chinese metaphysics good, Chinese um, metaphysics, Chinese politics bad, uh, good. Okay, so uh, let me answer this question by talking about some of the broader context of doing a project like this. Um, so I, in the book, I talk about that this project is a comparative project and I reflect on what it is to do comparative philosophy and i find that comparative philosophy today is finds itself in this position where the western where western philosophy is set up as a standard um and then all other philosophies are compared according to this standard there's a latin american philosopher called walter mignolo and he talks about the i think called the colonial bind that philosophy finds itself in now he's he's he was talking about mexican philosophy i think and then people would 
would refuse to accept that native native Mex that part of the world. Uh, I think, yeah, uh, native Latin American philosophies were Inca or Aztec philosophies were philosophy. And he said, it finds itself in this double bind. Either you say that native Aztec or Inca philosophy is just like um, whatever categories that Western philosophy use, or and but then but then there's no point for that philosophy to exist because you're saying well if it's all, if it already exists everything in the Western tradition anyway what's the point of studying the Aztec philosophy or Inca philosophy? But that or if you stress that it's so uh, native and so different, then it's saying then and then you say well that's not philosophy anymore. And so that's the kind of the the, the bind that comparative philosophers find themselves in. And I. Find, and I find this very dominant tendency to say that Chinese philosophy um, I have to actually assimilate into this, the structures of Western philosophy, um, you know, to use Western categories and to say that, okay, Confucianism is this, Taoism is this. Um, and I, in, in this project, I was trying to show a different way of trying to do comparative philosophy. And I took as my model Confucius when he said, when I'm in the company of others, I learn something from them. And I'm saying that when you, the, you, you cannot talk about, you cannot convince, you know, to Professor Wang, uh, Robin Wang's question, how you convince people in the diversity and inclusion people that, that you should do comparative philosophy. If, 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 if you can't, if you say that, okay, well, which is merely comparing and the Aztec philosophy is kind of like this, but, and, and, then, and then so what? The, but the, you really have to show that you really can learn something by studying another tradition. And so I try to sh and I try to show that Chinese tradition, you just cannot argue that empirically they dealt better with difference. And then and then you look at you, you first of all accept that premise. If you can't accept that premise, then again, yeah, then this um, I can't. You know, the, I understand that some people who wouldn't accept that premise, but like. If, if we do first of all accept that premise, then you then you and then the, the philosophy becomes pertinent. And then you say, well, why and how it is the case that that impacted the practice? Because I think that philosophy also, you know, to a very Confucian Chinese attitude that the philosophy should, the point of philosophy, you do it, you do it to like ameliorate practice. And so, so I, I deliberately set out to find an example in which it's unambiguous West bad China good. I'm not saying it's always the case. I'm saying there's one instance, and I did that in order to prove the point of to prove a comparative point that there is something that the West can from learn to learn from other traditions. It's merely to make that kind of pedagogic point. I do not nest. I do not at all think, you know, this kind of Manichaean attitude. Um, so that's just a kind of question of the this, the um, methodological approach. Um, and so, so why do I use the term cosmopolitanism? Because it, and it comes from the kind of the ancient Stoics who use cosmopolitanism to, to criticize, I think, that kind of rampant nationalism. People, you're, or, or, okay, I'm a, I'm a citizen of Athens, I'm a citizen of a particular city state. And then they said, no, we're citizens of the world, which is what originally cosmopolitanism means. So, what is different about Chinese cosmopolitanism is that I think arguably that. Uh, the Stoic version of cosmopolitanism actually appeals to the idea of tong, sameness. It appears to the very thin level of sameness, which I kind of it has its benefits and will and will work and will contribute. But I, I don't think that that can that's the total solution because the reality is, and this is where the kind of um, ethics of recognition work that Charles Taylor does about cultural differences comes in. The the, the reality is that people are very different, they have very different cultures. And then it's somehow, it's not psychologically satisfying enough for, for people um, to, you know, you tell, you tell people, you tell office, you tell the Israeli and the Palestinians, you're fundamentally the same. That's not gonna, you know, that, 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 that's not gonna somehow, when people fight, when they, have, when they feel they have real differences, just merely telling them that, they're, that they have, they're the citizens of the world, kind of doesn't cut it. And, um, and I think that you have to, think about the kind of version of cosmopolitanism in which you give due recognition to the fact that um, people are very, very that the, the world people are very different and then still come to a kind of commonality and so the main thing I emphasized in Chinese cosmopolitanism is this question of synthesis or hybridity or you could say creol creolization which is not good 
the kind of people from um, uh, the French, colon French colonies in the Caribbean talk about this term, that they, they, they creolize different cultures. But in some ways, you can think about the Chinese tradition like that is very, very hybrid. And that means that um, you write, you don't assert a kind of commonality in which uh, is very thin at a very thin level. It's, it's more that you mixed uh, all the, it's in Chinese, it's like you kind of become internal to each other. And then that's a way in which you can both um, uh, make, uh, do give due regard to the factual difference, but then that difference doesn't become a kind of um, confl conflictual. Um, okay. And then the question of, um, uh, so the other question was, whether Chinese uh, cosmopolitanism can be used to to critique itself, um, I think it was the, it was the question. Uh, yeah, for sure. Um, but obviously, I'm, as a philosopher, I talk about the ideal. You know, you know, when, when political theorists in the West they talk about democracy, they they're only talking about the ideal, the constructing the ideal, which is has to be. Well, I said, I think if they're good political theorists, it should be based on empirical evidence. But often, it's even not. Um, but the, the point is, when philosophers talk about the ideal, and then when political theorists talk about democracy, they don't ever have to talk about the non-ideal, the wars that have been fought in the name of democracy, how much terrible things has happened in the name of democracy. So, first of all, I think that um, we should recognize that what I wrote is an ideal. Um, it's not, it, so it's still a political theory, ideal text. And to some extent, that's, that's separate from the question of the non-ideal. Um, so, so that's the first thing. And, but then, yeah, for sure. I think China, sh uh, I can um, China should definitely be held today to, to this ideal of Chinese cosmopolitanism that I, that I did, that I try to reconstruct. Um, I certainly don't think that, um, you know, at any time, particular time in history, China necessarily completely lived up to this ideal. Um, you know, it's the ideal is always different from the from the non-ideal. And where the question, so the last question, whether um, China has learned these kind of bad things from 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 the interaction with with the West. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So I think that this um, this this discourse of consumerism as what is defining of the self, your ability to to have desires as um, this kind of appetitive desire as somehow essential to the definition of the self, which you see in from like Hobbes, you know, yeah, from that, what, what C.B. McPherson calls um, possessive individualism. I think I see that in China and obviously that's related to capitalism. And I think that um, that is something that I find very, very um, sensitive about because I, I see how they commodify women's bodies it's crazy on like in certain Chinese social media the commodification of, of female bodies and obviously I'm very sensitive to that and I think that's um it's not um that's not a uh, a good thing so so yeah okay so thank you um for your questions uh, thank you for your discussion uh does anyone have any other questions oh wants to share your thoughts on this topic. Mm, you can turn on your microphone. Uh, oh, yeah, I see Professor yeah. Chen Honglai, right? I'm a PhD student at Tsinghua University. Um, I work on uh, 19th century West African history, especially uh, specifically Senegalese history. And I also had a chance to uh, sit uh, in on um, Professor Xiong's uh, uh, classes about racism in, in Peking University, I think in 2020. Um, and I think it was, we, we discussed a lot about the history, the creation of race, the idea of racism in, in this course. Uh, me personally, uh, many things we discussed in this course come back to me when I 
because me currently I'm here in, in Senegal in West Africa to do my research work. And uh, on my daily encounter with African people, with, uh, with Asian and European, uh, this idea of racism, uh, it's, 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 it's very inspiring for me. Uh, perhaps I, I have a question not uh, more, less related to Chinese cosmopolitan, but more re relate, uh, related to the idea of racism. Um, uh, I think when I come to uh, Senegal, I feel very frustrated because uh, what I learned from what we discussed from professor uh, in in Professor Xiang's course, uh, that the, the whole idea, the whole uh, racial category, pers Western perspective of view uh, the others, view the rest of the world, is completely inherited by Senegalese people, and I feel uh, very um, the, the the kind of discrimination I didn't uh, I didn't really have it when I was in France. Uh, because people usually consider me as a French. Uh, they they did not accept me as a Chinese, but more as a French because they thought I was French. Uh, but when I came to, here to Senegal, uh, then I felt the the kind of the skill, the skin color, and also nationality, all the racial difference, uh, wholly shaped how age how African hair. Uh, thought about me and the rest of the world. And I cannot change it, even though I try to speak their language and behave exactly like they, they do. Uh, this is what I did in France, but it didn't work here. And also, I also um, observed how Chinese people uh, view African here and view uh, how they say Senegalese people here is also a very racist perspective. Uh, as they call all African people here as black, as Haitian, very, um, I, I personally really hate this word, but they keep repeating it, they keep uh, telling me, uh, I think their, their, their words are just very racist to me, and I, it's, it's very frustrating me to say how Chinese and also uh, African people completely inherited the, the, the whole tradition of Western racism. And while well, today, uh, Professor Xiang uh, talks about the Chinese cosmopolitan, and I was like thinking, oh, it, do we forget? Or, or it, is there a deep break um, in, in Chinese culture, in Chinese philosophy about difference? Because what we do right now, uh, and what we, uh, the idea we had several centuries ago is, very different, and also I, I do believe that African philosophy has also its con its tradition about dealing difference. But right now, the the hegemony, the the dominance of uh, Western racism is so strong that um, well, I sometimes feel really uh, frustrated. Perhaps it's more like common. Like I don't know, Professor Xiang has something to say about it. Thank you. Uh, hello, so nice to see you. Uh, um, I've, I've, I've only ever been in North Africa, so I've never been to like the um, more south, North Africa, I've only been to Morocco and, and stuff and such. Um, so, yeah, so like, uh, unfortunately, I think that that's just globalization of, uh, and I think that it, it, it's so, print, there's, it's not, it, it becomes very subtle. Like for example, the movies that you watch, for example, if you watch Hollywood movies, black people are always portrayed in a particular way. And then uh, Chinese people, like Hollywood movies, are always gonna be portrayed in a certain way. And the people who have never, you know, gone to China or so forth, they'll, they'll, that's their first hand, that's their education in what, uh, you know, Chinese people are like. Um, or the media, the newspapers, the way that they depict things. This is all these kind of very subtle ways in which you're kind of educated into, into understanding, understanding, uh, understanding human difference. And I think that what's really sad, I think, is that they what they've internalized is actually a kind of colonial um, racial ordering. Because I don't think that the black people, the, the Africans, think of themselves as the top. They think white people at the top is white people and then 
probably black people or, 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 and then you know whatever else they've they've inherited this kind of uh, racial hierarchy which is a white supremacist hierarchy and then the rest the white um the white racial view of the world um and um I, I, I yeah i mean that's partly why i kind of wrote chinese cosmopolitanism of cosmopolitanism as well um just because uh, i don't think that that is the only way for for human beings to think about difference that 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 should be the way that we think about it. there has to be other paradigms for us thinking about and relating to um to the, the differences between each other um and um yeah, it's just it's just very true. You know, the Franz Fanon, um, he he wrote this book, Black Skin, White Masks. He just it's just like a very common phenomenon that the they then they talk about how you know when they're first they they've never been abroad, they don't even have this understanding that they're black. They're just people, and then but then suddenly like but then but then now you you have this kind of it's going to mirror mirror view of yourself through the gaze of somebody else you see yourself through the eyes of somebody else and that somebody else is is um is the, is the white gaze and then i think that this this kind of white gaze has become just globalized um i think that so that lewis gordon the professor i mentioned in my talk he he says that uh he he tells students to think about in the textbooks to think about when they talk about the human being who this human being is. And they always talk about like a white man. So we just like internalize this idea that that's what the standard of what the, the human being is. Um, so it's, um, yeah, but that, I, and it's that very, very, it's very interesting to hear your perspective from Senegal because I've never been that South in, into the African continent. So that's really interesting to hear. Um, yeah, so I'm, I, I I don't know what else to say. But I think it's just uh just what we have now. Yeah, yeah. thank you. For, and I, and I kind of feel like that. Um, I don't know if it's, if if my feeling is kind of true. It's like when um, when European, especially France, they created the whole racial. It looks like there are some internet, yeah, internet connection problem, right? Hello. Hi. Um, can you still hear me? Yes, I hear you now. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Yeah, maybe Hong Lai's uh, connection <laughs> is not very good. And so uh, that last question bring us to the end of the session. I uh, many thanks to Professor Xiang for your wonderful talk. And uh, thank, I'd like to uh, also express my thanks to the three commenters, commentators, Professor, uh, Professor Robin Wang, Professor Wang Huayu, and uh, Professor He Jing. And uh, thank you all for your participation. And uh, see you next time. Bye-bye.